Okay, as promised, this video is going to follow on from the work we did today on that Snell's Law Summative Experiment. Now, I had hoped to go through this in class, but well, unfortunately we ran out of time. So I'll do it now and I'll keep it short, sharp and simple. So what I'm going to look at here is similar to what you'll have to do for your experiment. I'm obviously not going to make it exactly the same because then you can just copy my answer, which wouldn't be fair. Um, so rather than perspex into air, which is what we were doing, I'm going to look at an example when we're passing light from glass into air instead as illustrated here, and as you can see, the light ray bends outwards as it goes from a high refractive index to a lower, and the angle of refraction will always be greater than the angle of reflection. Now when we do that, in this hypothetical experiment, we do the same thing as we did in uh, the experiment with Perspex today. We try a number of different angles of incidence, so you can see here theta i goes from 16 up to 37 degrees. And for each of those angles of incidence, we measure the angle of refraction. And as you can see, the angles of refraction are a pretty wide range as well. And as we would expect, because the light's being bent outwards, the angle of refraction is greater than the angle of incidence for each of these different measurements. Right, so what we need to do here, well, first I'm going to explain the theory behind it, because it's a little bit complicated. Well, oh, hang on. All right. So to understand what we're going to do, we start off with Snell's Law. And then we're going to rearrange Snell's Law to get it into this form here. Sine of theta r equals n over nr sine of theta i. Now we can simplify that a little bit further because nr is going to be the refractive index of air because it's the light's going from glass into air. Now we know that the refractive index of air is 1, so that just simplifies down to sine theta r equals ni sine theta i. Okay, so far so good. Now here comes the trick. What about if we were to do something tricky and we were to graph those angles we had before, but rather than putting theta on one axis and uh, theta r on the other, what if we did the sines of those angles on the axes? So we put sine of theta i on the x-axis and sine of theta r on the y-axis. So you might say to yourself, well, why would we want to do that? Well, to get an idea of why we might want to do that, compare... Um, the equation we have here, sine of theta r equals ni sine of theta i, to the general equation for a straight line, y equals mx plus c. Now, whoops, let's go back one, getting ahead of ourselves here. If sine of theta r goes on the y-axis, then that becomes our y. And if sine of theta i goes on the x-axis, then that becomes our x variable. And if we then do the comparison between this equation and this equation, then you can see in that case that ni must be equal to m, which is the slope of a straight line. So in other words, if we plot a graph with sine of theta i on the x-axis and sine of theta r on the y-axis, then if we measure the slope of that graph, we're going to end up with the refractive index of glass, ni, which is what we're looking for. So it's a neat little trick for finding out the answer you're after, finding out the refractive index of glass. So graphing rather than uh, doing, I think it was like eight different measurements there, rather than calculating ni for each of those eight different measurements and averaging it. You could do it that way, uh, but it'd be a lot slower, and it's actually better to use this graphing approach for a number of other reasons as well, which we won't go into at the moment. Now, the one thing you might notice here is there's no plus c part. There's nothing here that matches with the plus c part down here. So what that means, is that we're expecting this graph to have as y-intercept c of 0. So if we set c to be 0, that disappears, and you've just got y equals mx. So in other words, what we're expecting to get here when we graph our data is a straight line that goes through the origin and has a slope that's equal to the refractive index of glass. So that's the trick. Now that we know the trick, we need to go back to Excel. Now, we can't plot the data at the moment, what we need to do here is calculate the sine of each angle instead. So how do you do that? Well, I'm going to insert a column next to each of these. And I'm just going to type in headings for these guys as well. Um, now, I'm not going to make them anything too special. I'm not going to use symbols like I did for the other one because it actually takes quite a bit of time to set up. I'll just put sine of theta i and sine of theta r there. Give them a bit of color to make them look pretty. And 
and then we're good to go. Okay, now what we're going to have to do in here is we're going to have to put in a formula. Now the formula is a little bit complicated. You might think to yourself that it's just going to be sine of the angle. It doesn't work, quite work like that because Excel, for some stupid reason, uses radians for its angles rather than, um, rather than degrees, which would be more sensible. But anyway, so this box here, I firstly type equals because Excel needs to know there's a formula coming up, and then I type in SIN for sine. And then I'm going to click here. And then I need to do something a little bit tricky here. I need to convert this angle into radians. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to add in an extra little bit here, times by in the bracket. And then we're going to do pi divided by 180 degrees. That's how you convert from degrees to radians. So I'm going to put 3.14159 into here and then divide that by 180, close that off, and then close off the other bracket, then hit enter, and then fill that down. Now at the moment you can see it's kept lots and lots and lots of decimal places, we should probably round it off to two significant figures, so I'm going to go up to here, and find the one that says decrease decimal, my mouse is hovering over that at the moment, and I'm going to keep pressing that, until I get down to two significant figures, two decimal places. And then I'm going to do the same thing over here in this column, but I'm going to do it for theta r instead. So again, equals, so Excel knows this formula coming. SIN for sine, give us yourself a bracket, click on the cell where the angle is, and then times by bracket 3.14159 for pi, divided by 180, Close the two brackets off, hit enter, fill down. Now I just went flying past that whole fill down thing. If you don't know how fill down works, it works a little bit like this. Go across to the bottom right hand corner and this white cross will turn into a little black cross. Once you get to that position, double click and it will fill down. There we go. And now let's decrease those decimals a bit. That looks okay. And then the final step is going, now we've got sine of theta i and sine of theta r. The final step is to graph those two things. So the way we're going to do that, first thing I'm going to do, click here and highlight the sine of theta i column, because that's going to be our x1. Once you've done that, hold down control, keep holding down control, and click and drag over sine of theta r. Once you've done that, let go of control, let go of the mouse, and go up to here, Choose insert, go over to this guy for a scatter graph, hit that, choose the first option, and there you go, there's our, our graph right there. Now we need to do a couple of things, it's not quite perfect yet. Now you can fiddle with this as much as you want if you're obsessed with making it pretty, but there are a couple of things that your graph needs regardless. So the first thing it needs is space for axis, label, uh, axis, axis labels. So go up to quick layout, Go down for the one that, and you might have trouble seeing this in the, in the video, but it's the one that says, looks like this. It's got spaces for labels on the sides, and it's got a little FX and a line of best fit. So we click that. Over here, we have a thing called the equation of the line of best fit, and also another thing called R squared down the bottom there. And that's the information we need at the moment. And then all over here, we also have spaces to label your axes as well. I'm not going to do that now. I'm going to talk about this bit here, and then we'll call it a day. Okay, so if we look at what we've got here, for starters, we've got y equals 1.4675x. Now, that 1.4675, that is our, um, the slope of our line of best fit. So that's our answer, basically. That's our refractive index, 1.4675. 7. So we've got that. And over here we've got our, our y-intercept. Now that should be 0. It's not quite, but we can explain that due to random errors. That's fine. And then this last guy down the bottom here, r squared, it's called the coefficient of correlation. Um, don't need to know too much about that right now. 
But basically, R squared is a number that's used in statistics. And it's about how well data fits a pattern. It goes from zero all the way up to one. So zero would mean completely random data that follows no pattern whatsoever. And on the other hand, R squared value of one would mean exactly perfect data where the measurements you make completely fit the pattern you're expecting to get. Now, we are pretty damn close to that with this imaginary made up experimental data. We're 0.9993. So that would indicate a very precise set of measurements. So we can use R squared values to, uh, to comment on the precision of the experiment. The closer that number is to one, the more precise your measurements have been. Uh, does not necessarily mean that your measurements are correct. It is possible to make really good measurements, but to still stuff them up and get the wrong answer. So it doesn't mean your, your measurements are correct, but it does mean that you've done a very good set of precise measurements. And we can kind of see that here because our line of best fit, all of our measurements pretty much lie on, lie on that line of best fit. Okay, so that's basically what you need to do as your next step. Go through the same process I have in Excel, create this graph. Obviously, you're going to do things like add titles to it and stuff like that. And then after that, you can start to think about maybe writing up your Pratt report as a draft. So think about things like an aim, an apparatus, a method, results, all that kind of stuff. Um, if you want to have a go at starting to write a discussion, go for that as well. But you should be able to start to write the bare bones of the Pratt report for now. And then when we come back, we'll get into that in a little bit more detail and I'll talk about maybe give you a few hints about some stuff you might want to consider in the discussion for your report. Okay, and that'll do us.